Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. So Alex Roy is the founder of the Human Driving Association, which is dedicated to raising licensing and safety standards for personally owned vehicles. Roy has broken numerous cannonball run endurance driving records in the electric, internal combustion, and three-wheeled classes, and is one of the world's leading experts on driver assistance and self-driving systems. Alex is also the founder and co-host of the No Parking and Autonica Cast podcast, co-host of The Drive on NBC Sports, and editor at large at The Drive. He's the author of The Driver, the book, and the producer of a new movie called Apex, The Secret Race Across America, which documents his record-setting drive across America. And I have to say, I just watched the preview on YouTube and it looks awesome. So I will be checking that out soon. Um, Alex, you can follow him on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Although I will say, I think his Twitter profile is the most active. So Alex, how are you doing today? Uh, Awesome. I'm so glad to be on your show. But wow, do I need to shorten that bio, man. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I actually cut a couple things out of your bio because yeah. uh, it was getting a little long there. But that's honestly one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you because you are working on a lot of different things. I think I know you pretty well from your Twitter profile, from the Autonicast oh. podcast. And uh, what else do I know you well from? And I guess as your, from your writing on the drive. So um, mm-hmm. I'm curious to learn a little bit more about what you're up to and you know how people know you. Uh, I, I do have one question though before you get well, we get started yep ask um so I, w- I want you to think of a quick response to this question whatever comes to your mind what's one word that you would use to describe yourself oh man uh mm, cranky contrarian cranky. i was thinking outspoken that's kind of what i had yeah. in my mind um, and you know, the reason why I asked that is because I think that oftentimes like in the spaces that you're working in podcast, media, mobility, there are a lot of the same voices, a lot of people sort of saying the same things because, you know, they sound good to help you raise money, whatever that might be. But you tend yeah. to always have a different take sometimes. I think I wouldn't say it's sometimes unpopular, but I think that it's sometimes just different. So, uh, how did you get to be the way that you are? Is that a loaded question? <laughs> Uh, well, the, the true answer would be that, yeah, I, I grew up, my parents were pretty modest people Mm -hmm. and they worked really hard to send me to the best possible school. And I went to a private school in New York city and where I didn't feel like I was part of like the other kids who grew up really privileged. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I was just by being there and I have had every advantage in life, but uh, my father really believed in like kind of like fighting for like what's right. Like mm-hmm. he always spoke his mind. And I, I just became like that too. Uh, and so as someone who loves cars and driving, um, you know, the rise of autonomous vehicles and like Uber and all the things that have been happening in the last few years, it just became really clear to me that there was just a lot of a lot of noise and not a lot yeah. of signal. And so when, you know, when Tesla, uh, I remember the first time I heard of Tesla and the first time I heard of Uber Mm -hmm. and the first time I heard of Uber, it it was used as a verb and I knew something was different. Like Mm -hmm. I knew it, I didn't know what it meant or what it was. And then I downloaded the app and began to use it. And the first time I heard of Tesla, I laughed. I like, I didn't get it. And then someone said, oh, but autopilot's coming out next week. Got to try it out. Self-driving. And then I got in. And I instantly knew some, the world was going to be a different place. Mm-hmm. And then I was surrounded. Is this a, is this a show? We don't, can we use foul language? Uh, I'm going to say yes. Since you're on, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> well, it's just, you know, I just suddenly people who were full of shit became, came yeah. out of the woodwork. Okay. And I just, it, and as soon as I, if it smells, <laughs> yeah, it, that there's something there. And so I just decided... I was looking at my career like in automotive and media and journalism and and I knew that I was never going to be a professional race car driver and I knew that Chris Harris yeah you, have you do you watch Top Gear? Uh no I don't but I know the name. Uh, so, but Chris Harris is like he's the young guy on Top Gear who's the good one. Mm-hmm. And he was a friend and I and I knew that my dream of being the next Jeremy Clarkson was not going to happen because people like Chris Harris exist. I'm not that good a driver. 
And mm -hmm. he's really, really good at what he does. And no one in life should ever copy anyone. And so I thought to myself, what is the most constructive thing I can do for the future of transportation? And it, it, it was to take my enthusiasm for enthusiast culture and become and learn everything I could learn about autonomous vehicles mm -hmm. and electric vehicles. And if I could take those learnings and deliver them to the people who were like me, then I could accelerate the arrival of safer roads and you know, a kind of a cleaner world. Yeah. That's how I became this guy. Gotcha. And I mean, I, I think that's actually a good description because that's sort of how I, when I think about Alex Roy, the person, that's what I think about. A car enthusiast, you know, has done all this cool car stuff, which we're going to get into the cannonball record and all this, which, uh, you know, I know the gist of, but I don't know all the details and that's why you're on today. But, you know, recently it seems like you've become, you know, maybe your passions still lie in the OG automotive space, but now you're talking all about uh, Tesla and, you know, even Uber and Lyft and the future of mobility. So was it sort of just a natural pivot, you think, or you think you just saw other people weren't doing a good job and you kind of wanted to take that role? Or how how'd you think about, it? I mean, kind of shifting what you're known for, or do you think you well, shifted what you're known for? Well, I vote, I mean, if one thought of me as the guy who likes to drive fast, that's probably right. never been true. Okay. I was just acting out. <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel but, like you know, I saw I, you like, referred to somewhere as like the bad boy of uh, car racing or something, the bad boy of driving, something like that. I don't I was, know who said that. I was that, a but... bad boy of a lot of other things <laughs> previously in my life. But, uh, you know, um, times change. Yeah. Uh, there was a time when, the you know, people on horseback – uh, were considered, you know, outlaws and cowboys, and then yeah. cars arrived, and then people became outlaws in cars. And people, you know, for for our, for any given era, people will push the envelope of whatever technology is available. And so, rather than look at electric vehicles or autonomous vehicles or driver assistance as the enemy, why not embrace it and make mm -hmm. it good and serve us? So I, you know, whenever people show up with an, some utopian vision, the world will, is x and it's become become y and we have no yeah. choice actually we have a lot of choices mm -hmm. you know a hundred years ago the the decisions were made you know by investors and business people that we would become a car centric society it had a lot of advantages and it had some consequences we live with them now and so right now we are at the intersection of all these technologies let's choose to make them great and serve us you for example are mm -hmm. play a really interesting and important role because who else comes from your background mm -hmm. who knows who really understands the dynamics the math um, the cadence of what it's like to be a driver mm -hmm. and with all these apps and platforms and hack that world not only for personal benefit but share those lessons yeah. through your twitter through articles through your podcasts through your books your appearances online and try to make life better for the drivers and for passengers i mean you're as far as i know you're the only one um <laughs> i think the there's others you, maybe not as well known but yeah <laughs> but not as well known and if one went back in time three or four or five years you know it it was just beginning to be clear that the financial reality of being a ride hail, a ride share driver, mm -hmm. was not what the platforms were claiming it to be. Yeah. And who, and someone had to step up and help and become the voice of those drivers and then bridge the reality between like the public perception and, and the reality on the ground and transcend it. And that's what you did. And so, you know, for every sector, for every job or technology, there's someone who's, who's first and loudest and tries to make it better mm -hmm. for everybody. And and so, you know, uh, that's, I hope that I serve that role for enthusiasts mm -hmm. uh, and safety advocates and bridge, you know, the old and the new in the same way that you've bridged the, the, the world of drivers and passengers um, and, and you move beyond it. Yeah. So do you see yourself as sort of bridging that road between the car enthusiasts and the autonomous vehicle side? Or is there a specific area of mobility or just all future mobility? Well, uh, all future. I mean, if I were to look at, say, micro mobility, mm -hmm. the person who's bridging it is Horace Dediu. Okay. I think you know him. Yeah. Uh, you've met. You guys have met. Um, I haven't Horace actually, Dediu, but at some point uh, we will. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you guys. You know, Horace Dediu was the godfather of micro mobility. You know, so mm -hmm. vehicles under, I forget what the weight 500 limit is. Five hundred kilograms. Uh, 
500 gallon, maybe that's what it is. Um, and so uh, Horace, he's a car guy. He's got, you know, he owns sports cars. Uh, he comes from the tech world. Um, and uh, and he is, a, and yet he's one of the biggest proponents of shifting to micro mobility and, and mm-hmm. all the advantages we, 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 we have by reducing the traffic in cities and moving people into lighter weight modes. So he's nailed that and, and we're lucky to have him. Uh, I'm a proponent of something that hasn't arrived yet, but it's coming. So, mm-hmm. you know, for all the benefits, and I absolutely believe that eventually, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles, driverless vehicles yeah. will be demonstrably safer than, certainly than the average driver. Yeah. Um, and most people are average as the definition of the word. <laughs> that even once that happens, it's going to take many years for, you know, uh, level four autonomous vehicles to propagate across the majority of urban centers, you know, mm-hmm. in, the, in the developed world. And so in between now and that and that ubiquity, um, that we have an opportunity to make the roads safer through better driver assistance. And so when I say we have a choice, um, I'm going to quote my friend Josh McManus, who's a great urbanist thinker. We 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 people can't be forced to use technology. They need to choose. They need to vote for it. Yeah. And so autonomous vehicles will arrive by a combination of cultural and political shifts. People need to vote for it, which means they have to choose it. And and I think that's going to happen. I think it's inevitable. But in all the places where autonomous vehicles have not yet arrived, we have a choice as to what kind of driver assistance will be available. What kind of cars do we want to buy? Mm-hmm. When, while they still have steering wheels, there are going to be many forms of driver assistance. And what yeah. will it look like? Will it be like we have it today, where mm-hmm. we have traction control and ABS and um, and some lane keeping? It, will it be uh, something we can override, which is what happens today? So, it, you know, it, driver assistance makes vehicles safer, but how much safer? And can you override it? Or will it be something that constrains us? And, you know, that is going to be very look very different in China than it will in Europe and probably than it will in the United States. Yeah. And so I mean, these systems are just starting to percolate now. Yeah. It's sort of like the messy middle in between this future of, you know, autonomous vehicles that work perfectly and get you everywhere for next to nothing and what we have today, the reality, you know, and I think that's one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about because right now you have a lot of people saying, oh, here's what it's like we'll be in the future and when everything is, you know, hunky dory. Um, but the reality is right now, you know, these things aren't even close to operating or existing and where they are. It's very small scale. And I think you and I probably both make this joke on Twitter a lot whenever we see something that refers to a self driving car, autonomous vehicle. I always say, I'm going to not read this and, you know, assume that there was a safety <laughs> driver in it, uh, for the yeah, most part. Yeah. Um, but it's like that messy middle and getting from point A to point B. So it, it sounds like that's what you're, you know, there's a lot of challenges, but also a lot of opportunities. And that's kind of what you're passionate about. Absolutely. I mean, look, I, as someone who wants to drive, it would be so much better if people who didn't want to could get into autonomous shuttles and mm-hmm. trains or take micromobility. You know, the more people who don't want to drive, who choose more efficient, lighter weight modes, um, the clearer our roads will be. Mm-hmm. And that's good for people who want to drive. And, yeah. you know, I'm both a, a safety advocate and I consider myself kind of a liberal person, but in other ways, I really believe in the market. You know, if, uh, if, if, we, ha- if we priced in all the externalities of car ownership um, and, you know, priced in or the cost of street parking mm-hmm. into our city, and there was there were mechanisms that allowed people to actually pay the price for their choices. We would have probably much safer, better cities. Yeah. And so on the on one side you have the war on cars, people who hate all cars, <laughs> and on the other side you have people you know who are want to invest in roads and not trains. They're all wrong. <laughs> they're all they're both wrong because there is you know I, I take a Zen view. There is an equilibrium for every mm-hmm. city of modes based on where people live outside the city and how far away they live. There's an equilibrium of, of modes. And if we gave people better choices, they would choose them. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like the way you put that for sure. Um, and I mean, you are a busy guy uh, out of all the stuff you're working well, on. I read off in your bio. I'm curious to know, though, I mean, 
I guess if I take it one step back, right? If, if you were at a party um, and someone asked you what you do, what would you say? I, were, I say, quick, I like to quick, say you're I at a party, right? I don't have five minutes. You got to give me the quick. <laughs> Automotive safety. Automotive safety. That's your thing? Absolutely. Yeah, that's what I would say. Okay. And I mean, I say that's... my life is complicated. <laughs> All right. I, I was wondering if you had like a quick uh, 30 second pitch, you know, when you're at a party, when someone asks you what you what you might be doing or if you tailor, you know, what you do, because you are working on so many different things. Right? I mean, I listed them all off in your bio, but is there anything how, how do you look at, you know, I mean, I let's say you're working it. on 10 I, things right now. How, but how do you how do you look at it? Like, what do you look at? Here's what I care most about right now. Here's what I'm spending most of my time on. How do you look at all the different projects you're working on? It, it, you know, it depends on the city I'm in. I'm in, okay. in Palo Alto. I say I work in tech, and okay. I may or may not bring up that I work for that a self-driving car company, okay. Argo. Um, but I don't want to, you know. But most of what I, a lot of my opinions are controversial, and you know, I don't represent Argo publicly. Yeah. Uh, if I'm in, in New York City, I'd say I work in media. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, um, <laughs> and I talk about no parking. My podcast with the CEO of Argo. I talk about Atonicast. Um, and uh, generally, I've learned to be a little quieter recently since I became a dad. The, you know, uh, actually Why one of the that? biggest, <laughs> well, one of the biggest problems has been that, you know, 15 years ago, I did these cross country, this cross country record, the Cannonball mm -hmm. Run record, and made a movie about it, which took 15 years to come out. The movie mm -hmm. just came out two months ago. It's called Apex, the Secret Race Across America, which depicts me acting like a crazy person driving cross yeah. country, you know, at a very high speed and evading the police and, and, you know, going on David Letterman. And I was a very different person back then. And it's hard to, it's hard to put that in context versus the person I am today. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people think that was reckless and dangerous. And I always caution it by saying that all of the things that were, it took to drive across country at 150 miles an hour, all the planning and preparation, that if everyone on the road today was as meticulous about safety as, as I was on that day 15 years ago, mm -hmm. we probably would not need autonomous vehicles to make our <laughs> city streets safer. Um, because people are very careless. I, even I am growing increasingly sloppy in, um, I, almost say I am not as safe a driver today as I am 15 years ago, which is why I always like to default and say that I work in, the in, in automotive mm -hmm. safety. Because almost everything I do today, and even what I did back then, I did um, with the notion that if I make a mistake, something bad could happen. If not yeah. to me, then to other people. And so what I do today, almost everything I do today, karmically, is intended to make up for the risks I took back then. Hmm. And that includes talking in a cautionary way around, about the film, it, it, working on autonomous vehicles, and also my wish to see, make it safer to ride a bicycle in New York. Yeah. where I, I was once hit by a taxi. Hmm. And so that's, I guess, the overarching theme. Okay. Uh, of no, I like that, this. That's... Uh, I like this new safety moniker for you. I think that a lot of the projects you are working on, I mean, even though, like you said, right, on the surface of the movie, The Cannonball, right, if I watch, I just watched the trailer and it's got a cool narration by Ice-T. Um, so that right there <laughs> hooked me. But um, once you get past the Ice-T and you sort of get into the you know, the, I guess the trailer, right. It sort of makes it seem like, Hey, this is a really cool kind of action packed film. But I think that, like you said, the gist of it is around when you start seeing like on the surface, Hey, yeah, we were driving over hundred, 150 miles an hour across the country, but you know, we were planning it very carefully, the roads, the routes, the gas, you know, everything we had safe, you know, looking out safety drivers, everything. Right. You know, a funny thing about driving cross country at those speeds is if you think about the kind of hardware you need in order to do it, it mm -hmm. is very similar to what goes in an autonomous vehicle. So you have to have incredible optics. Yeah. So we have, you know, we have binoculars with a stabilizer on them. We have to have, uh, you know, some, well, we had a night vision system. We had a FLIR thermal camera. We have radar detectors because the police mm -hmm. use, you know, um, radar guns. Um, we have uh, laser jammers because the police use LIDAR to detect <laughs> the speed of approaching vehicles. So it, we are using a lot of the same technology an autonomous vehicle needs to see. And you know we are uh, mapping out the terrain in the same yeah. way that autonomous vehicles have to map out the terrain. You need to know in advance what the road services are like. And then you take all safety. Then you take the notions of speed limits, you throw them out the window. Mm -hmm. and 
you have to be very, very, very attentive. You know, someday autonomous vehicles will be capable of driving much faster than people can safely. Yeah. There's a thing called Robo Race, which is uh, these uh, a thing called a DevBot. It's an autonomous mm -hmm. race car, which is trained to you know drive uh, around a, a racetrack. Eventually, they will be um, they'll be capable of doing laps faster than a human. And eventually, uh, AIs will race each other faster than a human could. Now, th that may or may not seem exciting to us now, but when that is possible, you know, I want to be the first passenger in an autonomous vehicle to cross the country um, at speed, at, yeah. at real speeds. And uh, because the adventure of seeing what technology can do that, yeah. to entertain us and test us, and we test it, is the, the history of all mankind. It, that's just who... Humankind. That's who we are. Have you, Harry, seen the movie Real Steel? Uh, no, I haven't. But I, I will say, I did. I did just watch Ford vs Ferrari over the weekend. So uh, I'm in a uh, I'm in okay, a racing a, mood right a, now. <laughs> that's a great movie. Um, uh, so there are two. There's a the movie Real Steel, and there's an article in Automobile Magazine from mm -hmm. maybe ten years ago um, uh, about the future of car racing. To me, are the most interesting pieces of pop culture that will lay out the future of the kind of technology and robots and people. Um, this article in Automobile, they asked a number of car designers what they thought the future of car racing would look like mm -hmm. if they brought back the Can-Am racing series, but there was absolutely no technological limitations. One of the guys, I think it was um, or the designer of the McLaren F1, who's, oh my God, I'm spacing on his name. He's one of the great car designers, um, said that, uh, if he were to design an, a race car with unlimited tech, that mm -hmm. it would resemble, it would be a cross between a, a, like a, a train and like a dragonfly about to take off, mm -hmm. that it would be articulated like a, like a caterpillar, mm -hmm. and that it would be always on the edge of liftoff and the edge of grip, that the driver would have only one control, it would be a rocker switch left and right, and that the vehicle would be programmed to lap at the fastest possible speed and the at the most optimal course. And all the race driver had to do was select, a, have a bypass, pass left or pass right, that if it encountered anything that the AI could not decide how to pass, the human would decide. Hmm. And that is, and then he said the human had to be on board because without risk to the operator, there is no racing, which is hmm. an interesting way to look at it. And the movie Real Steel uh, has Hugh Jackman in like this kind of father-son story in the near future where boxing is banned because it's, it's barbaric. Mm. And instead, robots box each other and they have AI that determines you know, attack and defense. And in the film, they have the underdog robot uh, that you know, they find in a junkyard <laughs> that its AI is just good enough to win, to win uh, matches against much better robots. Mm -hmm. But at one point, um, it is losing to a much superior robot and so Hugh Jackman puts on a uh, like a, a remote control like head unit, and so the ro he lets his ro his underdog robot use its defense to f to block, but the human steps in to manage attack, mm -hmm. and this combination of robot and human wins against a yeah. superior opponent. And I think these two, and that this is an interesting path forward for us in cars and in all society. That there are things that AI will do better, yeah. And in those cases, we should take advantage of it. But where humans have a place, you know, spontaneity and creativity, the humans need to control the machines. Yeah. And like when you your work about drivers and Uber and may, how to make a living, mm -hmm. you know, is really, really, really important because the fact that you and other drivers learn the details of how the Uber and Lyft platforms work, and I don't want to say exploit or hack but manage them yeah. and <laughs> overcome the limitations to do better, to make a living, to create, is exactly the model for how we should manage all technology. 
Yeah. Well, I think there's actually a lot of examples in new mobility of that type of hybrid technology that I think are much more feasible than others, whether it's, you know, like uh, truck driving with, you know, like the, the AI does sort of the long stretches where nothing really goes wrong for five hours on a right. highway. And then when, once you get into a city, you know, a human teleoperator or an actual human hops in the cab and does all the, the hitch and goes and all the complex stuff that they do there. Or even, you know, like the little self-driving scooters, right, that have a teleoperator, right, that can you know, they Mm -hmm. can go autonomously at low speeds, but if they run into any issues, it's not that big of a deal. It's not time sensitive. If a teleoperator comes in and takes over, um, you know, to uh, avoid a tricky situation. So I think there's definitely something to that hybrid, uh, nature of AI and humans that I think is probably a lot more realistic than it maybe isn't the best narrative or the sexiest headline, but probably a lot more realistic. It is. I mean, look, these th- these problems, these limitations will get solved. The mm-hmm. big problem, and this is, I guess I've made my name in it, is people who, who exaggerate mm-hmm. um, for press or for investor money or whatever. So would this be those, companies or media or both? Well, everyone? The, me- the, the media, the media <laughs> you know, the media, they, they get paid for not – off- if they're paid for clicks, they'll probably, you know – put out a lot of clickbait, but Mm -hmm. things like the information.com, you know, subscription media do good work. Uh, and, but of course, you know, um, a lot of startups just hot air and they suck the air out of the room for the companies doing real work. And that's, that's too bad. A lot of money flows to companies that, um, haven't figured it out. Um, Mm -hmm. and don't, and are just trying a lot of some, some founders, they just want to exit before the problems have to be solved. Gotcha. And you've seen this, you know what I'm talking. I mean, yeah, well, it, I mean, I think, time. I think that's the, da- I, I was sort of, you know, wondering like, what's, I, I guess two questions, right? I mean, wouldn't you kind of expect those founders to do that? I mean, it's kind of in their best interest to make whatever, you know, whether their product sucks or it's great, that's in their best interest, right? To sort of blow as much hot air to investors to try and raise as much money or to try and exit at the highest valuation and, you know, sort of take advantage of that, right? Like, would you expect something different? Uh, well, you know, there are founders who have are honest, who build yeah. real companies and then move on to build another one and another one and another one in a constructive way. In, mm-hmm. I, I mean, if one is if one can be a patriot, one should be patriotic for an America mm-hmm. where anyone with a great idea can come and learn and share and teach and raise money and invent and build a company that benefits not just shareholders, but society as a whole. That's the best. That's the best of America. Yeah. And then and there's many examples of it. But then you also have you have predatory, lousy, shitty, hollow, um, you know, uh, America ideas. And that is <laughs> and, well, you have there's good ideas with people who don't care whether they work or not, mm-hmm. who want to get in and get out before anyone, shareholders, customers, investors, ever get back a cent, and and sometimes never do. Uh, they're people for whom who are forgiven because they made a good faith effort and they move on to create real value and and a better world. And then there's just the frauds and hucksters. Every sector is full of them. Transportation's full of them. And um, you know, uh, we'll get past this. Uh, yeah. well, eventually, so what do you think? I, I agree because I, I think that, uh, you know, the downside is like you said, right? The the good guys aren't getting the funding, right? Or, you know, might not be getting the money or may not, you know, there's still some of it, right? But it's going to lessen the opportunity for those who are doing the good work. So what can be done about that, if anything? Uh, you Just know, call them out? Education, education is the, <laughs> the, the dominant solution, will always be the best thing. An educated populace, educated journalists, mm-hmm. investors will, you know, it. It, society is better for it. The, you know, I, it's like, I never thought I would work for a, in a corporate environment. Mm-hmm. Um, after covering the sector of, you know, autonomous vehicles and mobility and having been a journalist and an, like an angel investor, I took a position at Argo AI. Um, to me, they are one of the good guys. Um, Got it. You know, and, uh, and there are a lot of companies in the sector um, but only a handful of big ones. And I think I think that we should vote with our time and money to support yeah. the ones that are doing real work. Um, and that's, you know, I own a Tesla and I love it. Um, but it pains me to see that the narrative of Tesla and mm-hmm. the d- debate over Tesla, good, bad, on both sides 
has a lot of people acting in bad faith. Um, one can't, I, I love my car. I absolutely love it. Yeah. But the debate around autopilot is clouded by people on both sides who don't want to really talk about what it does, what it can and can't do. Uh, and it's just a, it's a wonderful example of the best and worst of, of, uh, of things being pulled into like this, like weird, like kind of cyclone, uh, in the media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's interesting. Cause I, I suspect we have a lot of people listening right now that may agree with some of the points we made so far. And they're probably thinking to themselves, all right, so what can I do about it? What has Alex done about it? What has Harry done about it? <laughs> it sounds like in your you know, career, you sort of, you've got, you've actually one of the companies that you supported, you went and worked for them. So that's one option. And I would guess the other one is sort of through your media empire, you sort of talk about them, right? Whether it's on your podcast or your writings at the drive is, is that sound accurate? Or is there something I'm missing? Yeah. Uh, well, I would, sir, I would support subscription media, like the good mm, with the okay. real ones. Absolutely. One should absolutely pay for content. That's real. Absolutely. Subscribe to real outlets. And, you know, what would that you be? Should, you mentioned the information. I'm the, a subscriber. What the, else we got? Uh, uh, well, not my, the Washington Post, probably. No, uh, <laughs> the New York Times, the Daily Beast, the New York Times. Forget politics. Uh, set politics aside. There's real journalism happening. Yeah. Okay. Um, whether you agree with it or not is not relevant um, because and an educated person can separate facts from opinion, even in mm -hmm. the same article. Uh, you know, buy books, read them. <laughs> yeah, don't read, you know, buy real books and read them. Buy your book, read it. Uh, the, um, you know, I don't think there's a lot of value in, uh, like, I would not watch recommended videos on YouTube, no, mm -hmm. no matter what they are, because chances are there's an agenda. Uh, it might be left, might be right. Just, just ignore it. Um, you know, to people who hate Teslas, go borrow one for a weekend and ask yourself if there isn't something radically important and good happening there. Yeah. Very, very, very important. Um, you know, when Tesla people tell you Cadillacs are garbage and Super Cruise is, is literally shit, mm -hmm. go rent if you can find one. With Super Cruise, go drive it yourself. <laughs> it's people are so caught up in the online discourse that they're not getting out in the, into the actual world yeah. to see what act, people are actually doing, what actually, how things actually work. And this is the, this is the problem of our, of our world. Companies are want to see us disagree online to prevent mm -hmm. us from actually seeing how products work and what people are saying, what food tastes like. Yeah. And that's not helpful. I meet a lot of people I disagree with all the time, and we often get along really well. And I learned mm -hmm. something. Um, and, well, no, uh, I, I think that's yeah. a good way to put it. I mean, I, I often, I think one of the ways that we've been able to build a strong business and reputation is because a lot of the times the products, you know, whether it's Uber and Lyft, you know, the products they're designing for drivers or passengers or whatever it is, is that's designed on, you know, in a boardroom or on a PDF <laughs> or on a PowerPoint in San Francisco, when it gets out in the real world, it's like a completely different thing, you know, I call it a shit show, but, um, it's completely <laughs> right. different. And, you know, just by going out, you know, so it sort of like gives me a healthy skepticism when I read, you know, a press release from a company, I say, okay, so this is what they think it's going to work. Like I'm going to go out and try it and experience it for myself and see what it is like in reality. Of course. I mean, oh my God, you know, I, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I had a long, what's, uh, I want to say war, but I, have, I had a long relationship with the website Electrek. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know you're, uh, you're not a big fan yeah. of them, right? <laughs> uh, I, I was unable to see an article of theirs without trolling them in some way because the, it's, it's literally, I mean, these people for a long, they're all Tesla investors mm -hmm. and they, they could not possibly say anything about Tesla that was negative. But um, what was most interesting about it and uh, about them, the editor-in-chief, Fred Lambert, you know, uh, I don't want to trash anyone today, but a perfect example of, of the problem in the world, it, one of the problems we have in, in the world in media right now is um, technology is not binary. Mm -hmm. It isn't good or bad. Um, it, you know, technology, it, it, it's like water flowing down like a hillside, like it, it's channeled. It's channeled by what it finds in its path mm -hmm. and eventually gets to the bottom and and what we put in its way and how it's channeled, you know, shapes that path. And so, you know, there's a debate about um, driver monitoring systems. You know, mm -hmm. should we have cameras in vehicles? Yes or no. What should they, 
do if they see someone nodding off? Uh, should they? I mean, the, the general consensus today is that um, a driver monitoring system attached to a, a lane keeping system or driver assistance system makes it safer. Mm -hmm. That's the general consensus. Uh, and the people will, who vote against it will say, oh, it's a privacy issue. I don't want a camera on me. And then there's a, and they might also argue, well, you know, if I have to pay attention, um, well, what's the point of having lane keeping at all? Which is <laughs> yeah. kind of a weird argument. But what no one will say is, well, if, if my car has driver assistance and I'm not using it and I'm nodding off, why doesn't the driver monitoring system um, trigger its activation? Mm -hmm. Like the whole world, the universe of how we talk about driver monitoring, and driver assistance and autopilot is completely insane. Because in theory, if we really cared about safety, every car would have a driver monitoring system. Mm -hmm. And anytime someone stops paying attention, it automatically turns on the assistance. Yeah. And yet we are not in that world at all. And it's because we are we allow ourselves to we allow the discourse and the debate to be de decided by others. Yeah. So when a site like Electric says, oh, we don't need driver monitoring systems at all and autopilot makes us safer without discussing the alternatives, we are shutting out a universe of invention. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the world people we, we, we talk about people are dumb. You know, <laughs> Americans are stupid. Like, you know, we're all victims, but that's not true. Um, we can, anyone can choose to look at what they're being told and say, maybe there's something else I'm not hearing. Mm -hmm. And go look for it. And when you find it, make your decision. Make up yeah. your mind. Cool. That's why what you do is important. So. Yeah. Well, no, I appreciate it. And I think that your insight is uh, definitely refreshing. So I don't want to keep you for too long. So I've got maybe one or two more questions sure. for you. Uh, you know, we've touched on a lot of uh, the stuff you're working on, the movie, your writings, um, your thoughts on the uh, mobility media <laughs> landscape. Um, mm -hmm. out of all, out of, I guess out of all the projects that you're working on right now, we already talked about the movie, but, um, you know, in depth, uh, what's most rewarding for you? What do you sort of like at the end of the day or end of the week or end of the month, the thing that you worked on where you're like, wow, I had the biggest impact on the thing that I care most about, which it sounds like to me from our conversation so far, as sort of driver safety and the advancement of uh, you know technology that helps with that. All right, so I'm absolutely going to plug my new podcast um, because it, it's called No Parking and it's with Brian Selesky, the CEO of Argo. But the the reason it matters to me is that I have actually genuinely learned something new mm. at, along with the audience on several episodes. Mm -hmm. and, I'll, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Sure. Because this, what we're trying to do, you know, people ask when autonomous vehicles will be quote unquote safe, when they'll be ready. And I actually don't buy the argument that that's a number, like that you'll they'll ever be, that we, you'll ever have a, a number which will convince mm -hmm. anyone to get in. Because we still get on planes, stuff yeah. happens. You know, we get on ships. Stuff's we, always going to happen, we, right? Yeah. We get into we get into Ubers and Lyfts with p strangers driving. We don't know. Yeah. <laughs> trusting that they want to live, and therefore we will too. That's insane. And so, you know, I I had a chat with Brian, um, and I said, and 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 he he said, you know, we need to talk to people on the ground and learn about what trust is. Like, mm -hmm. why do we trust each other? How do you trust a machine? And so we began looking for guests that would have real conversation with us in the cities where, you know, he wants to deploy self-driving cars someday. And, and we had, a, and there were really, there've been a couple of people I met through the show that really like changed my life. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is a guy named Yaz Shahab. He has an autonomous dentistry startup. And, and he said, well, well uh, yeah, you know, this, uh, this machine will do, it'll clean your teeth. It's a robot mm -hmm. that will clean your teeth. And Brian's like, what are you insane? <laughs> <laughs> and that's Brian, who's you know one of the the world's top experts in autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. And 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 so that was interesting because Brian's calculus of what it would take for him to trust an, a, a robotic dentist was you know very much like how someone who doesn't know anything about autonomous vehicles yeah. would ask about getting into a car. The other one was Red Whitaker. Uh, this guy is like the, the one of the world's top robot builders, mm -hmm. and he's worked on many na disasters where robots were necessary. Like the Chernobyl, uh, uh, you know, if you've seen the TV show Chernobyl, yep. 
they sent robots to you know kind of clean it up. Mm. He built robots that went uh, to Three Mile Island, the nuclear oh, disaster, cool. and 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 he's sending robots into space. And he he was in the Marines, and he he is so inspiring. Like when you hear people like him speak, all the pol- political battles and all the the BS today about the president and, and Bloomberg, everybody else, just evaporate. And you think, mm-hmm. my God, anyone can make a difference if they step away from the media world and actually want to build something or invent something, it's still possible to be a creator of something new and fresh. He was so inspiring. And the last one is a guy I've met recently named Josh McManus, Mm -hmm. who was an urban theorist. And he talks not just about, um, you know, we have to vote for autonomy, but he talks about uh, the the inventor uh, Buckminster Fuller. Have you heard about him? Bucky Fuller invented a number of things, buildings and the, the Damaxian vehicle. And he, his nickname was Trim Tab, and it's on mm-hmm. his tombstone. And a Trim Tab is uh, you know, a control device which uh, creates low pressure behind it. So it allows people, it allows a, a machine or a person to make a, you know, a gentle um, change, a mild change that can have enormous and consequential um, mm-hmm. uh, differences over time. Uh, it's... Uh, the way McManus described himself is a deliberate comprehensivist. Mm-hmm. And a, I guess uh, that he is kind of a human trim tab. And I thought this was really inspiring and, and, and kind of made me a lot more optimistic for the world. That there are yeah. people making a difference, not a political difference, but like a difference on like a, on a mass scale, but from outside politics. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a really important point of view. Very cool. Yeah, no, and I think we'll uh, we'll definitely link uh, up to those three episodes and uh, your new podcast, the No Parking Podcast, one of the many projects that you're working on. And uh, as always, great chatting with you. Uh, if people want to get a hold of you, what is the best way? Twitter, go to the No Parking <laughs> Podcast, uh, uh, go to Argo AI, say- <laughs> <laughs> lots of options, uh, right? Alex, Alex Roy 144 on Twitter is probably All the right. best way. Follow me there. Uh, no parking pod is our, uh, uh, our Twitter handles. Very cool. All right, Alex, appreciate it. Sure. Thank you.